Good morning. Welcome. I'd like to present the Harvard Trade Union Class of 2024. <laughs> to the graduation of the 111th class of the Harvard Trade Union program. We are so We are just thrilled to have obviously our graduates here with us, all 38 of them. Friends, family, colleagues, our amazing faculty. I've seen so many alumni in the room of the program, it's just, it's amazing to look out at this room and see all these wonderful, familiar faces and, and the, the families of this year's graduates and all of us coming together. So for our guests, let me just tell you a little bit about what this class has gone through together during the past five weeks. You've had more classroom hours than a semester um, at, as a Harvard undergraduate. You've had almost 100 different classes. You've met about 60 different faculty members. You have had many mindful minutes. You can explain <laughs> that to, uh, to your friends and family. You've toured Boston labor history sites. You went back in history in Lowell and, and Lawrence, Massachusetts. You visited our local brothers and sisters in the labor movement at IBEW Local 103, a long time and really um, amazing supporter of our program. I understand you sang karaoke, although I'm glad to say I was not present for that. <laughs> you dug deep to define your own personal narratives. You spent two days negotiating. Uh, you met the authors of many, many books. Play cricket. <laughs> you welcome special guests at our public forums like Mark Ehrlich, Avi Chomsky, and Lynn Reinhardt. You watched movies and met someone whose last name is Disney. You read thousands of pages of homework. <laughs> you supported each other during a kind of dark and gloomy time here in Boston. Our weather, sorry, was not terrific for you guys, but we got you in despite a, a snowstorm, one of the few snowstorms of the year. And you made more than 37 new friends. So now I'm going to talk to the family, friends, colleagues of our graduates. Everything I just told you explains why you haven't heard too much from the participants over these five weeks. They have been busy. But what I want to say to you is thank you for your sacrifice. Five weeks is a long time for somebody to be away, whether it's your family member or a colleague. And you stepped up and filled in for those five long weeks. Maybe you maybe you had to work two jobs to cover. You rearranged your lives so that we could do this work together. 
So I have one request for you, despite that sacrifice. Please be patient when you hear these folks, when they come back home, say over and over again, well, at Harvard, we did this, that, or the other thing. It's going to happen. I'm just say it. It's going to happen. Be patient. I can say without any reservation that this is truly a special class, and I heard that from faculty over and over again. And it just gave me so much joy hearing from that faculty, from Alita, from Jack, from Tina, those who are in the room with you every day, how you've grown and found your voices. We, I hope you feel, brought the best of the best from Harvard, from around the country to you. We brought world famous experts in their fields and you engaged them in a remarkably meaningful way. You were always respectful, but never intimidated. You also brought an unusual seriousness of purpose. You showed up at every class. You had clearly done the reading. All right, most of you <laughs> You worked on your presentations outside of class. You took field trips together. But most importantly, you created a community, a vibrant community within this group. You spent a lot of time together. It's unusual for adults to, you know, you think about that as maybe like something you do as a kid or in school. But you came together, you created this community, you treated each other with respect, kindness, and graciousness. You took care of each other, you made it a safe space to share personal stories, to share opinions, and you challenged each other's ideas and opinions, but not each other. You made each other better because you were here together. So where do you go from here? My advice, take it for what it's worth, rest and reconnect with your lives. But then think about how to use not just the information that you learned here, but the experiences that you had and the growth that you achieved. Be better at your jobs than you were before you came here. The labor movement needs no less in this moment. Spent a lot of time talking about how challenging the issue is for the, the environment is for workers, for the labor movement, for you individually. But we also talked about the opportunities that this really unusual moment presents. You now have tools to play an even bigger role in being part of the solution to those challenges. And then my last request is keep in touch. I mean, you see how many alumni we have here today. It's wonderful when our alumni come back for graduation. But even more than that, help us learn from you how to make this program even better for the benefit of your brothers and sisters who will come next and keep that vibrant community alive, both among the 38 of you, but also now as you join our alumni community. So last thing I want to do before we move on, I know everybody's very anxious to get to the rest of the program. Can't imagine why you don't want to just listen to me all morning. Um, but I have to take the opportunity to thank the team that makes the HTUP happen. And it really, really, really is a team effort. So I want to thank our amazing faculty, many of whom are sitting here with us, our support network here within Harvard Law School, especially the events team. We had a lot of events. It's a lot of rooms. It's a lot of just moving pieces to put this together for five weeks. And many of our uh, members of our events team are represented by here, Local 26 and SEIU 32BJ, and we're very grateful to them. I want to thank the CLJE team, Jack, who teaches and is so present for everybody. <laughs> Yuri, who always was there to help with events and just pitch in uh, however was needed. Pam, who handles the finances, which can be complicated. Giovanni, where's Giovanni, who just keeps us all organized and just makes sure that all of our trains run on time. It's really an amazing undertaking. Uh, Tina, who was, hey, Tina, who was 
uh, just mentioned in all of those ways, but also I'm always just amazed at what like a calm and helpful presence you are in the classroom. But of course, most especially, I have to thank Alita, who does everything for this program, who puts her whole life <laughs> everything and she does it all so amazingly well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I am now going to turn it over to our CLJE faculty director and our esteemed colleague and longtime faculty member in the HTUP, Richard Greenman. <laughs> with this program for a very long time. And I would say that it, um, when, people come, when people ask me, um, how are you doing, professor? I say, better than the world. It's not a very high standard, is it? <laughs> I would say, if, 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 until the last few years, if one were to ask, uh, how's the union movement doing in the US? And we would have said worse than the world. We, we, we were declining for a long number of years. Uh, we were losing our, our importance and our central to, to the country. And we can see problems developing in the country that worsened because we didn't have the strong union movement that was needed. Inequality would not be as high as it is today if unions were at the, at, at the rate of organizing, of organized workers in the 1960s or 1970s. Even in the days of Ronald Reagan, yeah. the unions were, were, were more, more, more widely around the country. And, and that's not the only problem, that, that, that the country needs unions to, to play a big role to resolve. And, Today, in the last couple of years, uh, I get the sense of the answer is no longer worse than, than the country. It's mm, maybe better that there is a brighter future coming in, in, in statistics. We just see signals of things going on. I'll mention a few of them to you, and, and our, our, our speaker, uh, Sean Fetty is one of the, the signs of a of a, of a, of a, of a, of a of change in, in, in the, in the uh, union movement. First, you can take our university. Uh, we are a UAW organized. <laughs> um, UAW has played a big role here, but so have other unions. Various unions have helped uh, graduate students and, uh, 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 and postdocs organize themselves. And the greatest success in that today in the, in the union movement is in higher education. That's, you just look at the, the numbers, it's just zooming up, winning elections with 90% of, the, of, the, of, of the, the, the workers voting. So we have sign number one, I just look around and I say, Wow, I remember when the when the work when the students were forming the Harvard Union for this campus. People said, "Oh, this will never be. This is ridiculous." And the the, the, the deans and the people not taking it serious. Um, okay, that's a, a, a first sign. Anyone who's looked at the uh, uh, opinion polls sees that the American people are right now understanding the need for trade unions to play a much bigger role in, in, our, in, 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 in our country. And in the last two or three years, we've had collective bargaining successes that uh, are stunning. Now, for, to me, is very interesting is we had the, uh, 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 the Writers Guild strike. We, we, we had a, a set of strikes that were the you know, mill workers strike. And suddenly, gee, the Teamsters don't even have to strike. And there was a huge victory in the, in, the higher, in the higher education in California. Just took one day strike, 
and then the employer caved in and said, okay, we're, we're signing the contract. Those are, are glimmers that the future indeed is going to be better and better than it's been over the last it's, it's 40 years, but it's been the slow uh, uh, of the decline. So my, or I hope <laughs> to, to be able to analyze your success over the next uh, four or five years. So anything you do in your in your unions, so on, that, that 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 takes advantage of this situation. So I was thinking, since when I gave a little uh, talk to some people about this, they said, "Oh, what about the political situation? Isn't that important?" Well, imagine that uh, 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 um, Mr. Trump wins an election. There will be chaos in this country. Well, we've got to go through all the possibilities. <laughs> I thought, well, what would you like what you want to do if, if there's chaos? You might want to have a national strike. Okay, he's got a plan for 2028. If enough union contracts come up in the right place, yes, you actually could have a a, a, a national strike. You know, not just a strike, I assume, for, for, for union workers, for, it's for the whole country. It would be something for, for democracy. If, 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 if Mr. Trump does, does not win, uh, then the May Day event uh, would, be, would be different, obviously. It, would be, it, would be, it might be something about the triumphs that have occurred um, with, with a, a increasingly favorable democratic uh, group. So I look at this class, uh, uh, and, and people say, what's the greatest class? I hear them saying that all the time. <laughs> and I'm going to say, this is, 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 is not so good. But, <laughs> so, but I'm going to say what I think is actually true. It's the first time I've ever said this to a class. Is you are the class that has the opportunity to actually possibly change the, 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 the union position in this country. And if you do that, that's going to work great throughout the whole country. So I'm hoping for you guys to do the best you can. And, and you can't do any better than that. Um, and if you want any help, advice, and so on, um, I and the people who work with me and the people in the program uh, I'm the economics part, so it's a slightly different crowd of people. Uh, we are a free resource to help you. And I think, I see Tom Cogan here, I think I can speak for MIT as well. <laughs> we, are, we, we want to see success. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay. I am beyond thrilled to introduce our graduation speaker, UAW President Sean Fain. Sean Fain was elected president of the 400,000 member United Auto Workers almost one year ago. So that makes him president for the thousands of graduate and law students, uh, UAW members that we so value here on campus. He came to office after 29 years as a member of the union, first as an electrician for Chrysler at the Kokomo casting plant in his home state of Indiana. He is the proud grandson of UAW members. He served in many different elected positions in the union before winning the first ever direct election for the position of international president. And all of that is impressive and important. But it doesn't begin to convey the central role that President Fain has come to play in the revitalization of the labor movement in our country. Through his leadership during last year's strikes at the big three auto companies, he brought to the American public the clarity of his vision for what a fair future for the working class looks like. And he took this vision to the shop floor to the picket line, to a picket line with a president for the first time in American history, to every corner of social media, to the boardrooms of some of the biggest corporations in the world, and to the Oval Office. And that message has been consistent everywhere he goes. 
UAW members, those who hope to be UAW members, like those workers at non-union car companies who are now part of the UAW's organizing campaigns, and those many people who work hard every day and just want to believe that someone is speaking their truth and fighting for them have found hope in his leadership. To paraphrase him, he sets expectations high and settles higher. It is truly my honor to introduce our graduation speaker, UAW International President, Sean Fain. You know, I look at uh, here at Harvard, I mean, it took two strikes 
and an ongoing struggle to achieve progress. Uh, and you know, th th those grad workers made here at Harvard. And uh, you know, just seven years ago, before Local 51 18 won its election, grad workers were expected to get by with a salary of uh, just under thirty thousand dollars a year. Um, you know, obviously that's not a lot of money uh, by any standard uh, when you're trying to have a roof over your head and, uh, and, and, and have a living, again, have a life. Uh, but today, because of the union, uh, because workers are, are ready to stand up and have been ready to stand up and they've stood up, you know, because of a new way of organizing um, and bargaining wins across the sector in higher ed, um, you know, grad workers at Harvard and beyond are now uh, going to be making over $50,000 a year. Still not enough. Uh, it was progress, but it's still not enough. Um, you know, it's still far from where we want to be. Uh, but as we continue to organize with more organizing, with, with, with more of that fight, you know, we believe that we're going to make higher education a place where, where people can work with dignity. Um, I always say this about our fight, uh, you know, it's, it's about ending a race to the bottom. And that's what's driven our culture and driven, you know, uh, the, the corporate talk in the last 40 years plus. Uh, you hear the word competition. I've said this a lot throughout our Big Free Strike campaign. When I hear the word competition, I, I, I think of one thing, race to the bottom. Because that's all it means. It doesn't mean competing to be better and to, to make life better for everyone. But when, when the corporate class talks about competition, they mean one thing. I can pay this person less, so I'm going to kill this plant or kill this job, kill this area, and take it here where I can exploit these workers. And when I can't exploit these workers anymore, I'm going to take it somewhere else where I can exploit them even further. That's not a life I want. That's not a country I want to live in. It sure is not a world any of us want to live in. That's the fight. said this over and over, if you give these corporations or these institutions an inch, they take miles. And whether it's auto or whatever sector it is, um, they'll keep driving wages down and, and they'll keep driving working conditions down. And the only, the only fight in that, the only, the only power we have back as people, as workers, is, is when we form unions. Without a union, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir. If you're an employee at will. Um, you can be fired for any reason or no reason at all. And we see it every day. And then people say, oh, but the NLRB or the EEOC will protect me. Well, you know, a lot of people, when things happen like this, I've dealt with this a lot in my life. But the friends of mine that didn't have you, they got fired. When you get fired and you're, you're a working class person, you live paycheck to paycheck. Um, who has $5,000, $10,000, or all this money to go take on it? corporation or, or, a, or a business uh, to, to, to get that. And what happens in that fight? You spend two or three years as they drag it out in court, starving to death. Um, the, only, the only equalizer in this equation is organized labor. It's former union. That's where your power is. That's where workers have power. And I say this over and over. If, if, if the COVID pandemic taught us anything, um, for all the horrific things that happened, millions of lives were lost due to it. There was a there was a silver lining in that. You know, it, it made people reflect on what's important and what's important in life. And it sure as hell not not living to work. Uh, people want their lives back. You know, and the fast food industry was a great uh, indicator of that. When you saw during the pandemic, workers were making twelve dollars an hour. <coughs> said to hell with this. I'm not going to waste my time going into work and, and risk my life to do this job for that type of wage. So what they do? They stayed home. And then what happened? Wages went up to $20, $25 an hour in fast food industry. We've been fighting for $15 an hour. Wages went to $20, $25. To me, there's a great lesson in that for working class people. And that lesson is simply this. They didn't have a union. They just refused to go to work. But it's, it's, it's a perfect lesson for organized labor, for working class people. If we harness that power, nothing in this world is going to move. If working class people stand together, nothing turns. I don't care what billionaires or what companies start what business, 
if they don't have workers there to make the product or to deliver the work, nothing will move. We have the power. We just have to concentrate and harness that power and take back our lives. So that, that's that's a big focus. What we're looking to do and going forward, um, you know, only a union, uh, only a unified working class using the labor movement as a catalyst is how we'll halt the race to the bottom and win economic and social justice working class people. Um, you know, and that's why we have to honor the fight that so many brave unionists, many of them young people, uh, have led this in this country over the last few years. Um, I say this over and over, you know, this is our generation's defining moment. You know, we're at a critical juncture in our history, and this is a defining moment in where we're going to go, not just as a nation, as a world, but as a society in the future. We're going to continue on this track of a few at the top taking all the wealth and everybody else scraping it get by, or we're going to take our lives back. Um, you know, when I, when I see higher ed organized workers, fighting Starbucks and Amazon. Um, I see a new labor movement that can transform life for working class people everywhere. And I can guarantee you this, when there are fights for economic and social justice anywhere, UAW is going to be able to stand up with them. Um, you know, I want to take a moment here too, I thought it was interesting, uh, nothing better this morning, but I want to take a moment to express my solidarity with, with the badass teachers of Newton. Um, well, over the last couple weeks, you know, held a strike and resulted in a strong tentative agreement. And it was great, nothing better than I got here late last night to wake up this morning and turn the news on in my hotel room and, uh, and uh, see the media talking about that victory at Newton, and it's, it's awesome uh, when you wake up as a union person and that's what you see on the news, because uh, a lot of times we don't hear about those things, and, uh, and it hasn't been the case for a long time with organized labor. You know, we're on the rise now. We're back. Um, you know, you think about this, you know, public sector strikes are illegal in this state. Um, that's something that has to change. Yes, sir. Right. But we know the only illegal strike is an unsuccessful one. <laughs> um, and let me tell you this, you know, the, the Newton teachers, they, they didn't lose. Um, they chose to leave like so many other teachers have, and they won. And, and I always think of this, solidarity and unity are held a lot stronger than the law ever will be. Um, talk a lot about our fight in the Big Three recently and, and talk about how, and, and understand this, I was just sworn in as the first directly elected president of UAW just 10 months ago. Um, and my first, I was sworn in on Sunday, March 26th, and so on Monday, March 27th, I was running our bargaining commission. <laughs> and I had no agenda, no planning, no input in the planning of this. I was sworn in completely cold. And, you know, with a thousand of our delegates, and it was a very, very divided house, to say the least. Um, you know, it was our first ever election. There was a lot of hard feelings in it. And um, so, you know, it was, uh, it was a, not a fun situation to walk into, but, uh, you know, we seized the moment, and uh, we did what we do best, and we, and we, we, we pushed. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about solidarity and unity, and, and the one thing I'd say, anyway, I get asked this a lot, by the media uh, when we talk about our success with our recent contract negotiations, about what was the best thing in that contract that I thought we achieved. And really, to me, it wasn't the gains we made, it wasn't, all the things we did were good, the wages, improved uh, retirement security, um, you know, all the improvements we got, cost of living back, things like that, they're all great things. But the best thing in the entire big free contract campaign and strike for me was that I saw our union come together. And I saw our membership come together. And not just, you know, there's always been this divide between the top leaders of the union and the members. Um, you know, no disrespect to everybody in suits today, but I don't wear suits very often. I do it in DC, that's about it, or a wedding or a funeral maybe. But, um, 
Um, and it's not a sign of disrespect, it's just it's me, it's just where I come from. I'm a working class person. And uh, we always had this problem in our union particularly where you know, upper leadership was a person in a suit and they were untouchable. And it's um, so one thing I made a, an oath to myself, no matter where I go in this union, um, not that I was, this was ingrained in me as a child growing up, never forget where you come from. Yeah. I, I come from poverty, and I'm proud I come from poverty. My, my grandparents went through a great depression, all four of them, and uh, they were destitute and desperate. They lived in the South. They didn't have, in my grandpa's words, a pot to piss in. And uh, what changed their lives was when they moved north, they migrated north, and they were able to get jobs in the factories. Two of them went to GM, one of them went to Chrysler, and they lived the American dream. They went from scrape, scraping to get by and, and destitution uh, to being able to afford a house, to have, have a vehicle, to take vacations. I mean, it's sad that over the last four years we've watched that dream die again. Um, but, you know, I, I always talk about this, you know, like my grandmother. Uh, during the Depression, uh, her and her siblings were left in an orphanage in Tennessee. Uh, you know, I mean, it was, and it was a, that was an norm. That was a, happened a lot back in those days. People couldn't afford to take care of their kids. They left for an orphanage. So, you know, and, and I, I say this for one reason. I look at some things going on today politically. I look at the talk about border security. Nothing pisses me off more than when I turn on the news and see one of the top two issues that they say at this election coming up is border security. Uh, border security to me, and especially on the South, is just one thing. It's, it's about the same thing that the wealthy always does, that the billionaire class does, is to keep taking more and more of the profits while we keep struggling to get by. They divide us. And they divide us over any issue they can find, whether it's race, whether it's gender, <coughs> You know, who you love, what color your skin is, or where you come from. Um, destitute people trying to cross the border to find a better life are not our enemy. They're not taking our job. <laughs> when I see these people, I see my grandparents. And the only difference in my grandparents and these people trying to cross the border are the fact that my grandparents were born in this country. And, but the destitution and poverty knows no bounds and knows no limits. And our job as leaders and leaders in organized labor is to eradicate poverty everywhere. That's our challenge. Just to say also, this is a special week for the UAW. Um, today, um, we celebrate what we call White Shirt Day. Um, and uh, it actually, it's, a, it's a, one of our most treasured holidays in UAW. Um, and actually, this Sunday, February 11th, um, marks the anniversary of our historic victory in Flint, Michigan, of the great Flint sit down strike. <laughs> And this is the first white shirt day since we won our historic stand-up strike. And so, you know, there's great significance to that. And, um, you know, we're celebrating today in UAW because it falls on Sunday and a lot of our workers won't be at work. So that's why we celebrate this year on, on, on Friday. But, um, um, you know, we, we named our stand-up strike in homage uh, to the sit-down strikes of the 30s, the founded this union. And, um, so one, thing I, I, one of the things I wanted to do when I took over as president was get back to our roots as a union. Because, uh, I, just to put it bluntly, we, we, UAW became a company union, in my opinion, over the, over the course of my career. Um, um, we're way too close to management, um, it, you know, adopting a work together philosophy. And you know, I, I can speak to working together schemes I've seen in most industries, and typically what working together means is whatever the company wants you to do, and if you do it, we're working together. <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't work for the workers. Um, working together in UAW, in, in, in auto, over the last 20 years cost us 65 plants. 65 plant closes, just in the big three alone. That's hundreds of thousands of, of jobs gone. It's families ruined, and it's communities destroyed. 
And it's all due to two orders, corporate greed. It's not because of a need to, you know, sales are down and, and you know, things just aren't moving. It wasn't because of, you know, recession. It's because of corporate greed. It's because they can make, they, they, were, they were making profits, making a lot of profits, but they wanted to make more. And when they do that, they do it at the expense of communities and workers. And again, it's not a society I want to live in. And society, I'll spend my last breath fighting every day. Um, so, you know, we, we named our stand up strike as a homage to the sit down strikes, you know, and, and that's, you know, when I say we're getting back to our roots, you know, as a human fights for everyone. And the dream's big, the wins bigger. Um, you know, we've taken a lot of inspiration from our higher ed members uh, who've been organizing unprecedented numbers. It's the fastest growing sector in UAW now is higher education. Uh, the East Coast and the West Coast is just exploded. And it's great to see that energy, and it's great to see these young workers um, that are that engaged. Uh, they're, they're really helping us now, even in organizing the South with our, you know, in auto, uh, because they have energy like nobody else, and, uh, and they're some of our, our best members. And, uh, you know, Brandon and see, I'm lucky, we're lucky enough, I'm blessed enough to work with Brandon every day, and, uh, and, uh, to see the future of what our union's going to look like, and, and I know we're going to be, be, in, be in good hands. Um, you know, we're taking that inspiration from higher ed, and we're bringing it back into the industry where our union began in auto. And, um, um, you know, those of you that don't know, in our recent stand-up strike, you know, it was the first time in our history that we took on all three of the big three at the same time, but we struck them all at the same time. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things I was criticized for when I took over. Uh, I brought in, you know, I, I felt like UAW institutionally needed to change. Uh, and those of us who were brought up and ingrained in that system, uh, we knew one way of doing things. And I, so I brought in some outside people with a fresh set of eyes to look at things and uh, and put a plan together on how we would approach these things and, and really wanted to turn things upside down. And, and we really did. And, uh, you know, as a result of that, we, we Negotiated the greatest contract in the history of our union, and, um, and it still wasn't perfect. We still didn't get everything we wanted. But I will tell you this: I mean, if if, uh, if you get everything you want in a contract and bargaining, then you didn't ask for enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, by strategically attacking all three at once, you know, we we, we turn the tables on the company. Something they've done to us for years. They would they would always whip whip saws against each other, you know, and pit plan against plan company is company. So by, by not targeting one company and bargaining agreement while two others sit and then going to the next and the next, by taking all three on at once, we were able to turn the tables on them and then whips all the companies against themselves. So for instance, if we got something in Ford, we'd go to GM and Stellantis and say, hey, Ford agreed to this. We're not moving off this. And of course, if we didn't get something, if we got something somewhere else, we'd go back to them. And and, and the thing that gave us great power was, and I'll tell you this, um, with that strategy was just, um, you know, if I would have had my way, I would have loved to just struck all three, all out strike on day one. I mean, that, 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 the vindictiveness in me, the frustration <laughs> in me, uh, 29 years as a frustrated member, we were watching us go backwards. If I would have had my way, we would have hit them all at once and uh, taken everybody out. But. Luckily, I had smart people around me, <laughs> uh, higher ed people, and uh, that were able to talk sense into me that, look, we've got to think about this, you know, uh, from a better approach. And so, you know, we, it, it, it could have been played out any better. Uh, with the stand-up strike, um, with, with targeting, you know, we, we looked at every single facility the Big Three had and who it affected down the line, where their, where their pipeline came from, how it affected the supply chain, all those things. We had mapped it out, mid-level, high-level targets, and uh, it gave us immense power to bargaining table. That and the membership. The membership gave us our contract campaign. We never had a contract campaign in our history. Running a contract campaign to get members engaged and get them rallied around our issues. That is what brought the membership together. If I say this a lot, we, we, we were planning on four, having 14 actions. 14 different rallies leading up to bargaining. Uh, when we turned it over to the membership and said we want you to hold rallies and, and take, take a hold of this, take control of it, our members held over 140 actions. Oh, up to <laughs> and 
And that was the catalyst for what gave us success in bargaining because we wanted to do 14 as a goal. I mean, again, we ain't low. We turned over to the membership and 140 actions were planned. And when you're at the bargaining table, and it was, it was like a dream for me to be able to walk in there one day, and Ford came back to us with the same thing they proposed two weeks earlier, to just look at the vice president and say, look at the company and say, you just lost Kentucky truck plant, and look at the vice president and say, take them out. Um, and, and there's nothing they can do about that. And, and uh, the companies knew, they saw that the membership was energetic, they saw they were fired up, and they knew that, that, that they knew the issues, and we were rallied behind that, we were unified. And that's what gave us the immense power of the bargaining table. To have that power week after week, to keep the companies guessing of what's coming next, if they didn't address the members' concerns, uh, they knew they knew they had a, had a, had a fight on hands. And it enabled us to, to take a strike that would have had to happen very quickly if we did all out strike. It enabled us to, we could have endured a strike for months using that, using that philosophy. And the companies knew it. They were planning on us going all out. They knew me. <laughs> And so that's the biggest thing, you know, when you go into bargaining is knowing your adversary yeah. and knowing what expectations are. I knew what they were expecting you to do. And so, you know, we had to counter that with something that was unconventional they weren't expecting, and, and it worked to perfection. Um, you know, you know and, and, and the cool thing with this, in the wake of our stand-up strike, just like in the 30s, uh, you know, the rest of the non-union auto workers, the workers all across this country, you know, now... They caught fire. Uh, we had non-union workers, as we were striking, sending authorization cards to us without us even asking. <laughs> thousands of workers. And so, you know, in a few short months, we have over 10,000 non-union auto workers um, in the South that have signed cards. We've launched organizing drives at dozens of companies now. And, um, you know, as of now, we got, you know, our drives at Volkswagen and Chattanooga, um, Hyundai and Mercedes in Alabama. Uh, they're making huge strides. This week alone, we announced we hit, we hit a majority at, at Volkswagen in Chattanooga. Yeah. 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 We're looking at hit the majority at Mercedes uh, hopefully in the next week or so. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's really going. And we're going to win. People said this. All I've heard when I ran for this job, all I heard when we got this, we said our demands was, You'll never get this, you'll never get that, you can't do this, you can't do that. You know, we delivered on every damn thing we were told to do. And, and, and we've been told, I've been told this over and over, you can't organize the South. But you know what, we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to win in the South. Once the first domino falls, I can guarantee it, the yep. rest will come. Companies fall in the same tactics that they always have. You know, uh, since we negotiated our record contract, we've seen the non-union sector. What did they do? They they saw the energy. They saw the workers wanting to organize. So they started giving what we call the UAW bump. <laughs> uh, you know, they're giving workers raises, um, eliminating their their wage tiers, things we negotiated for in this round of bargaining, because they know we're coming for them. And uh, but the beauty of this is we're claiming. You know, and, and so as soon as the first one happened, we're like, yeah. Thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> UAW stands for you are welcome. And, uh, <laughs> so you know, we, we're claiming it. We call it UAW Bob, and we're going to continue to claim it. And, 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 and in this fight, you know, we're going to do what we did in our contract campaign. Our contract campaign was about one thing. It was about, I'm a visual person. I need visuals to connect the dots. And so it was about connecting the dots for workers. And we got more than we bargained for because it didn't just connect the dots for our members. It connected the dots for the public. And you know, we ended up with 75% of Americans siding with us in that fight uh, because we pointed out the gross inequality. That we pointed out we had our members regurgitating the talking points that the corporations made a quarter trillion dollars profit in the last decade. CEO pay went up 40% in the last four years, while worker pay went backwards. Um, it's an easy cause to get behind. And when you go to the non-union sector, it's, 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 it's double or triple that. So, you know. We're, gonna, we're fighting this fight the same way we do the others, with facts. The facts are on working class people's side. We just have to remind them of the facts, keep piling home the facts, so that when they try to divide us over race and gender and border security and guns and whatever else other issue they want to divide us over, we stay focused on the priority and the agenda, and that's the priority. 
uh, we have to stay unified on those issues. Um, you know, but, um, you know, when they did these raises, the companies, you know, they didn't do this out of the kindness of their hearts. They did it for one reason, because they're afraid. And, uh, you know, they're afraid of a UAW, and they're afraid of organized labor being strong, and they're afraid of these workers getting their justice. And, um, you know, a lot of these uh, drives going on the South right now in right to work states, you know, um, uh, you know, a lot of the stuff going on is designed with the right to work laws to you know, allow companies to crush worker power, and, and we're seeing it, the response right now. Um, just last week, we had a panel van driving around Detroit, driving by Solidarity House, which is our headquarters, and driving by plants in Detroit, had my picture on it, and said, uh, learn the truth about the UAW, UAWuncovered.com. They're putting billboards up now in uh, Kentucky and Alabama. Um, the Alabama legislator, uh, the governor actually came out, you know, against uh, the workers organizing down there, talking about how the evil UAW, and uh, they formed a site last week called Alabama Strong. Um, again, you know, uh, villainizing everything about unions and what they stand for. So, um, you know, I take it as a compliment. I mean, it means we're doing the right thing. Um, and but but you know. The, the fight in this is simply this. We've got to keep people focused on the facts, keep workers focused on the facts. And, and the facts, the gross of seeing wealth inequality and the profit margins that our workers create, by the way, you know, that's what we keep telling our workers. Like, they gave you, a, Toyota gave a quarter raise a year ago, 25 cents. They gave two or three dollar raise here recently after our contract. Um, but they still cut their medical benefits while doing that. And as we tell them, you know, the fruits of your labor are what generate these profits for them, not vice versa. So you, we, we've got to harness that power and take it back. And the only way you're going to do it is just by organizing. So, um, you know, so, so you know, we're standing up with working class to change society, to take on the billionaire class uh, that's controlling all the wealth and calling all the shots. And, um, you know, I say this over and over, you know, when 26 billionaires have as much wealth as half of humanity, we have a crisis. 26 people yes, have as much wealth as half of humanity. That's criminal. Criminal. And I say this till the day I die. Billionaires have no right to exist. <laughs> no one on this planet needs a billion dollars. I'm sorry, it's, just, it's pathetic, it's disgusting, it's obscene. And again, not, it's not the person, I just don't believe any one person deserves that type of wealth. And, and they're not, if someone's getting that kind of wealth, they're doing it at the expense of, of millions of people. And that's the problem. We talk about, you want to fix the healthcare issue in this country, you want to fix retirement security for people, you want to fix Medicare, Medicaid, you know, pensions for all, Social Security, decent wages, um, that's why we don't have those things. Because a handful of people are taking everything. And that's got to stop. That's what our fight's about. Um, you know, everything we see in the UAW is possible because people decide to think different and to act different. And, you know, we, we took inspiration from our new members in higher ed. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I talk about a lot of things we had success with, but you know, uh, we wanted to change the status quo in this union. And, and one of the things, again, I was ostracized and laughed about for in this bargaining was talking about a 32 hour work week. Again, taking our lives back. You know, I visited Black Lake, which is one of our training centers in this country. And um, uh, when I go there, I go to the library a lot and read. I do a lot of research. And the interesting thing I found when I would look back on old solidarity issues from the 1930s and 40s, was our leadership back then was talking about a 32-hour work week and a 30-hour work week. In the 1930s, our leadership was talking about that. And it got me to thinking, like, what the hell happened in the last 80 years? Because we were agreeing to 12-hour work schedules, all these alternate work schedules that basically make workers work seven days a week, unlimited hours, um, and, and stealing our lives. And so we really thought it was imperative to get the discussion going again about a 32-hour work week. 
And we were laughing after that. You know, a lot, a lot for it in the media. We're not gonna, we're not gonna let that go. I mean, we're, we're coming for it. Uh, we want our lives back. When you talk about a just transition and stuff like that, when you talk about getting our lives back, we can afford a 32-hour work week. Again, it, it's not, and still pay the same salaries or more money. I mean, the money's there. It's just, it should be concentrated in the hands of a few, of a few people. That's, that's the problem here. And, um, you know, working class people deserve a life. Um, you know, uh, we talk about the environment. You know, in the 70s, again, I was uh, doing some research at Black Lake. Many people don't know this, but in 1970, when we opened Black Lake in northern Michigan, the UAW was the first union to host a meeting of the United Nations there. And I, I found it shocking when I went to look at this history that at that time, Walter Ruther just passed, it just died. And our current president at that time, Leonard Woodcock, was talking about the internal combustible engine. This is June of 1970, the internal combustible engine and how it's poisoning our environment. That's 54 years ago. I was a year old. Um, and our president, the UAW, back then was talking about ice engines. And we hear this big debate today in this big dialogue between the two presidential candidates. One saying, kill the battery industry and we don't want to, we don't care about the environment. And the other saying, we're going to embrace it. And um, we have to have clean air, clean water to survive. Uh, but, but I found it interesting, you know, just to think back that 54 years ago, our leadership was talking about this, and, and again, we lost sight of that. Um, you know, but, but these issues, wages, environment, taking our lives back, health care, retirement security, it, it, these are what matters to, to 75% of the public. That's where we've got to focus again. That should be the platform as we're going forward. You know, the one thing I'll say is we were mocked about our audacious demands, but I watched what happened as a result of aiming low and settling lower. That's what our unit has done, in my opinion, for years. We, we, and, and I was told this. You're setting expectations too high. You're damn right we are. We, we want expectations to be high. You're not going to land high if you aim down here and you settle down here. So we're going to continue that fight, continue doing that. Um, um, you know, and, and our future depends on that. And, and one thing I want to say when I talk about being unified, staying together as working class people. One of the things I'm really looking forward to that we push for. And it's one of the hardest things I thought we would be able to, I, I didn't think we would get this, honestly, in, in bargaining with the companies. And it's probably one of the things I'm most proud of, other than becoming unified, was getting our, our next uh, expiration date to be the end of April so that we can have May Day, International Solidarity Day, uh, as a, as a bogey for trying to take the entire working class out in 2028. Um, we uh, had selfish intentions for changing the date from the fall expiration to the spring because in auto, that's when sales typically pick up, and that's you know we, I, I would rather be striking them uh, when they need when 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 that's moving the best, when sales are going the best, when things are booming. But when we were looking at targets and when we could do that, we really thought, wow, what a better day than May Day, you know. Um, uh, so we're, we're calling other unions. We've talked with a lot of other unions already about making that target. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to what we can do in the future with this uh, to, to take action and, uh, again, take back more power for working class people. Um, you know, it's going to take an organized labor movement and working people standing, standing, standing together uh, across you know, all of our differences. And, uh, and uh, you know, speaking of all of you as you graduate today, um, you know, I, I think about everything you can bring to your organizations and uh, to your unions, the labor movement. Um, I, I, I just sit and look at you guys and I think of myself in the 90s and early 2000s. I was going through the studies for a school in Indiana. Uh, uh, you know, my life then, I was just one, I wanted to be more active than I did. I, mean, I didn't have any ambitions of being a union leader. I didn't uh, have ambitions of being UAW president one day. But here I am. And so don't ever sell yourself short of the impact you can have and where you can go. Um, uh, this is a beginning, what you're doing right now, to make yourself better, to make you a better servant to your memberships, to the working class. So don't ever lose sight of that. Um, you know, you never know where your past is going to lead. Um, I 
got pissed off in my plant, decided to run for office in my plant. Then I was pissed off with how things were going with the international. You know, I was, I was, I was a negotiator during the bankruptcy back in, in the Great Recession. And that was a real eye opener for me because I saw communities were going to be destroyed. I saw, you know, uh, the reality of uh, plant closings and how that affected communities and people. And that just it, it lit a bigger spark in me. And, uh, you know, I wasn't happy with how things were. And if, if uh, it wasn't for the work of a lot of uh, radical union members that decided to form <coughs> United All Workers for Democracy, or UAWD, which is a caucus within our union, to take our union back, um, I wouldn't be standing here today. I mean, they pushed the one member, one vote initiative. We got it passed. Without that initiative passing, uh, we would be doing the same old things we've been doing forever, and everything you've seen happen in the last 10 months would have never happened. So uh, don't ever underestimate the impact one person can have or where you can go in, in, in your organizations and labor or whatever it is you do. Um, this is a starting point. So, uh, um, you know, we need to return to our roots. Um, you know, we need a whole new approach to take on our class. Um, you know, and, and as, I, as I would say to all of you graduates, so this is our generation defining moment. This is it. We're in it. And you're in it. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, what you all can bring to the future. I mean, that's your charge. Um, as a generation of trade unionists, uh, ready to enter the battlefield and, and for the working class. So uh, um, I, I, I can't wait to uh, continue to fight with you and join you in the fight. And I uh, just want to take the time to congratulate you all. I know I probably talked way too damn much. I'm sorry. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not good at short speeches, so uh, uh, I've, I've got a lot going on. We got a lot, you know. We've got so much ahead of us. I mean, this is just a start. People uh, come up and, I mean, it'd be nice to sit back and say, "Hey, we negotiate a great contract. I'm going to rest on the accolades." But this is a start. This is the beginning. We've got so much work ahead of us to take it back our lives. So I wish you all luck, and can't wait to get in the fight with all of you. Thank you. Spoken class, they always got to the essence of the issue, 
always remembering the meaning of solidarity and being in a union. No two better people could have been chosen. We will first have Julie Hebert from the United Steelworkers Metallo in Quebec, Canada, and then she will be followed by Shamia Turner from the Northeast Region Council of Smart here in Boston. Bonjour à tous. Mon nom est Julie Baird. J'ai le privilège de servir le syndicat des métallos comme responsable de la santé et du justice du travail. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julie Baird, and I have the privilege of serving the syndicat des métallos, district fire steel workers, as the health and safety coordinator. I first want to recognize and welcome those who have traveled from around the world to be here today to celebrate this graduation with us, namely Australians. <laughs> I want to thank again uh, Sharon Block, Richard Freeman, Sean Fain, Alita Castillo, Jack Schoenborg, Tina Lee, um, for, as well as all of our facilitators and lecturers for their outstanding support uh, and work throughout the, the entire course of this program. Thank you. I am also extremely proud to have people who have traveled from Quebec to attend today's graduation, who I would like to recognize in French. Je tiens à saluer dans notre langue la délégation du Québec, le directeur québécois du syndicat des métallos, Dominique Chemieux, le relativement nouvellement retraité adjoint du syndicat des Québécois, Donald Noël et sa conjointe Daniel Laporte, un ami d'enfance, Jacques, et finalement mes deux parents qui se sont déplacés pour être ici. Ma mère dit c'est mon père, Jacques. My parents. <rires> It was on one of our main social activities over the course of the program that some of my classmates told me they would put my name in as our class speaker. I was absolutely delighted by the honor, and in the following days, I started thinking about how I could possibly summarize the depth of such a life-changing experience this has been in five minutes. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you right away to relieve some of the pressure I put on myself. It is impossible to tell you just how incredibly transforming these five weeks have been. As I kept reflecting and digging deeper into my experience, my strongest thoughts, my strongest thoughts, sorry, were the humbling mistakes I have made throughout throughout some of my time here. I thought I would teach all of you about where I'm from. <laughs> I thought I would teach you how Quebec is different from the rest of North America, how our working class was shaped by our linguistic struggles, how we've had the quietest of revolutions that enabled the French-speaking lower class to access education and move on to positions of power. I thought I would teach you about our laws, which are known to be much more progressive because of the French heritage we still build upon today. And I also thought I would teach you how much hope I hold for my people to one day finally become an independent nation. But I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong because I assumed that I could teach a lot, when in reality I could learn a lot more than I could ever teach. I believe my story was unique. Turns out we have 38 different unique stories here for the 38 people who are graduating from the Trade Union Program Class of 2024. On my very first day here, I met a sister who is an incredibly strong and caring woman, and also a domestic violence survivor. Shortly after, I met a brother who impressed me by how quick he was, not only to reach out and help others, but to recognize the kind gestures he encounters on a daily basis. I've also had the privilege of finding three brothers who literally traveled across the world to be here and taught me that our cultural differences don't really matter as long as we're able to understand each other's lovely accents. <laughs> I got to know siblings whose energy to fight injustice can move mountains. I learned from dedicated and passionate advocates from the building trades as well as from public sector unions. I learned from siblings who are incredible role models to minorities that have been absent of these spaces for too long and finally get to share their experiences here. I obviously won't be able to tell you about every one of my classmates and the reason why their story is unique. But believe me, I have been deeply moved for many different reasons by every single one of them. And could easily spend hours telling you how the people we've met here have had and will have a profound and lasting influence on each other's lives as a collective unit. The shift from me to us didn't happen overnight. It was through deep conversations and a lot of funny moments that we were called to build our solidarity, support each other, and most importantly, 
learn from each other in this incredible program. As the class now knows, French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau has a theory on the human being's perfectibility. In a nutshell, the theory states that our greatest ability is the one to become better versions of ourselves, always changing, always evolving, and always building on our core values. I now urge us to learn from our mistakes. Where we used to see eyes, may we now see we's to build the solidarity we absolutely need to tackle the challenges that will come our way. I will leave you with a personal translation of one of my, of one of my very favorite poems by the great Québécois poet Gaston Miron, which I will first read in French. Nous avançons, nous avançons, le front comme un delta, goodbye, farewell, nous reviendrons, nous aurons à dos le passé. Et à force d'avoir pris en haine toutes les certitudes, nous serons devenus des belles féroces de l'espoir. Translation. We move forward, we move forward, our forehead like a delta. Goodbye, farewell. We will return, we will have our backs to the past. And by dint of having hated all servitudes, we will have become ferocious beasts of hope. Thank you. Smart and a proud sheet metal worker of Local 17 right here in Boston. That's across the river. We are neighbors. That's awesome there. Um, I want to thank our previous speaker, Julie Eba, for her inspiring words of wisdom and her words of wisdom throughout the course. She's a native French speaker, which I'm, I know that you gathered. Um, so. She's been doing more work than all of us juggling those two languages. I also want to echo her sentiments in thanking Sharon Block, Jack Trumpour, Aaliyah Castillo, Sean Fain, and all of our lecturers and other support staff that have made this program a raging success. I would like to give special acknowledgement to the president of my union, Bobby Butler. Bobby. Uh, for extending the opportunity, Chrissy Lynch, who couldn't be here today, who is the president of the Mass AFL-CIO, which sponsored my way, and my family and friends who are in this room and online. I stand before you today with my highest degree in education, being a high school diploma, and a sheet metal journey person's license, and my union card. I would never have made it to this podium without the support of my labor family. And of course, I want to thank my classmates for the rigorous discussions for trusting me and for trusting me as one of their class speakers today. Congratulations to the 111th class of the Harvard Trade Union Program. So, Monday, we go back to work. And it may seem like another day, but really, it is the start of a revolution. For we now fully realize that the front lines of democracy takes place on the job site. We come from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the United States, where the labor laws in some countries are better than others, where through hard-won battles, the workers bargain for a permanent seat at the table. But in each of our respective countries, it's a force that puts us of our humanities and turn us into nameless automatons if they had the chance. We are at a crisis point, especially in the United States. Those same forces are the ones who, at this very institution, rail about allegedly stolen words while standing on the shoulders of and holding the hands of those who have stolen land, stolen bodies, stolen lives, and stolen labor. These are the ones who have historically denied the pettily convicted, the indigenous, the enslaved, or anyone else deemed other a voice on a planet we're all born naked to. We all live in democracies. We're able to enjoy all that that entails in our free time if we can afford it. But the reality is that too many of us spend an inordinate amount of time selling labor to small dictators and still may not be able to make ends meet. The corporate goblins believe that we are asking for too much. 
that we want everything free when we only want to be able to contribute meaningfully to our society, enjoy those we love, and work and retire with dignity. The elite mistake us workers for themselves and believing that we will never be satisfied, when for them, even a billion dollars are not enough. Unionism is a technology that we can use to lift each other up and ensure that we all get a fair shake. And I don't just speak to you or on behalf of my classmates, I speak to history. It was not lost on the mill worker when she could not expect to live a healthy 10 years making fabric, that her fate was tied to the enslaved picking that cotton. And parallels can be drawn from the disposability of those lives today when our firefighters, who are tasked with saving our lives, must worry about the impact of toxic chemicals in their equipment on their health. I can't but help to notice the similarities between the agricultural and domestic workers who are left out of the protections of the National Labor Relations Act in 1935 to the precarious workers of today's gig economy and how closely the consequences of being an Uber or Lyft driver mirror the detriments of sharecropping. The, underpinning, the underpinnings of U.S. labor history still carry the stench of chattel slavery. And my fellow black Americans may be surprised to hear me say that I care nothing for monetary reparations. I believe what's needed is complete labor reform. Yeah. I commend Jennifer Abuso and the current National Labor Relations Board appointed by the, by the Biden administration with the strides they are making in favor of workers' rights. But we should not be at the mercy of whoever holds the presidency. Laborers are what keep any country thriving, and we should always have a seat at the table. In that vein, I also speak toward the future. It is time that as a labor movement, we put meaningful investment into proactive organizing strategies. We need to think in centuries as our enemies do because we live in a because when we live in a culture of reactivity, we are often too late. Personally, I am currently fundraising for a project taking place next month to introduce young girls to the building trades. And Mohammed Awal um, from AFSCME, one of our classmates, is raising funds to build a school in Ghana. Actions like this will go a long way in educating the next generation about our values, as well as pave a way for them to begin to cultivate their own voice. And we need to make space for the voices of young people. I am also galvanized by the work being done by my other labor siblings in this room to make sure that their organizations are being more inclusive and address workers as whole human beings. Some examples include the attention being paid to the mental health of police officers in New South Wales, the impact of domestic violence on the membership of the United Steel Workers, and the fostering of diverse leadership within the building trades unions. There were so many brilliant ideas being shared in these rooms by this cohort. I sincerely hope that we keep in touch and hold each other accountable for the futures we promise to create. And finally, I speak directly to those corporate goblins, those new robber barons who seek to puppet us through those small differences that make us diverse, such as our chosen gender expression, who we love, what bodies we inhabit, who seek to hold us hostage, to seek to hold the most vulnerable of us hostage to poverty wages and horrible working conditions, by making us concerned about whether or not we can put food on the table and provide for our families. To these titans of greed, those who have confused themselves for God, I want you to know that we are legions, we are multitudes, we are the workers of the world, and we are coming for you. Fist raised in global solidarity. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. Thank you.
we're going to begin with Amanda Nisha Sawyer, Sawyer Turner. Yeah. Yeah. Aminata Stevens. Yeah. Adil Nadeau. Arturo E. Aguilar. Yeah. Brandon Milo Duke. Yeah. Ryan A. Epps. Yeah. Shatan Green. Yeah. Donald M. Brown. Class, class, everybody, we're going to do class feature 
Shot Fame. Please flash, flash picture Shot Fame.